that has ever overcome your life and there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind you've always been with us every battle you've already won and we've already won come on we declare no weapon and there is no weapon
good to me. One more time, can you raise it up even a little louder in this place? Oh, you are good. In the morning I'll say you are good. In the evening I'll say you are good. You are good to me. Can you just begin to put your hands together this morning? Today we're doing something very special that we do every single year at our church. And what we're going to be doing is actually we're going to be praying over all of our students that are going back to school, all of our teachers and instructors and professors. And so this is what we want. If you are a high school student or a college student or you're a teacher or you're a professor, if you could just lift your hands for us. We actually want to pray for you today. Lift them high and proud. We want to pray for you today. Come on, look at this. This is amazing. We're also going to pray over, look at our amazing kids. Come on, can we give it up for our beautiful, beautiful kids? This is Pastor D. Pastor D is our children's pastor. She's always crushing it in the back. And so, once again, if you're a a teacher or you're a college student, lift up your hands today. Pastor D is actually going to cover you guys in prayer. Because we believe that as we go back, we're going to go back filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by God and protected by God. So, Pastor D, can you pray over our students, our teachers? Absolutely. Um, I just want to say something that God is here. Yeah, amen. God is good in the morning. God is good in the evening. And we have so much to thank Him for. Amen. And one of the things we, you know, I'm so thankful that we get this opportunity to cover these yes. students to cover these children, to cover all of you that raise your hands, going back to college. It's almost like going into a war, you know? But hallelujah, you are equipped, you are empowered, you are covered, you are protected by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is in you, He is for you, He is around you, He is protecting you, and you have been called for such a time as this, Amen. Amen. To have a voice in this atmosphere, to have a a, a life that is well lived for His kingdom. So we're going to pray from a position of authority, of power, and of agreement. Amen. 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 Because God is getting ready to do something amazing in this generation. And we're going to get behind it. And we're going to have a revelation of what it is and what He's called these kids, this next generation to do. Amen. Can you tell I'm just a little bit fired up about this? Come on. Amen. I am, you know. Um, the devil is a liar and we serve Amen. a God of victory. So Amen. Amen. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for each and every student in this room today. Yes. We want to cover them right now in the blood of Jesus. We declare, Father God, that they shall live a life well lived, called according to their purpose, the plan of God upon their lives. We plead the blood of protection over them as they walk into those public schools, into those private schools, into those colleges and universities, Father God. We cover them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, that their teachers and their lecturers, Father God, you will give unto them wisdom from heaven, Father God, to teach correctly, to teach powerfully, Father God. And I thank you, Father, that as they go back to school in the next few weeks, Father God, they will know with confidence confidence and with authority that they are yours, that they are in the palm of your hand and that they're going to do great exploits for your kingdom. We thank you, Father God, and we cover them with your spirit. We say, Father God, they shall have the boldness of the Spirit of God living on the inside of them to speak as you anoint them to speak, Father God, and to be that light in that area, in that school, in that uh, college situation, Father God, the light that shines forth brightly and powerfully for Your Kingdom, Father. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' Name. And everyone said? Amen. Church, we're going to go back into worship and we're going to sing a song about just calling down the, you know, a fresh fire from heaven. We want to pray this as a prayer over our students, over our teachers, over the next generation, over your life as well. So can you join in worship together with us today? And let's pray this over our students. Let's make this our prayer today.
Without reservation, God, if I burn, I'll burn for you. Sing it as a prayer. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. I want to burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire.
So let's just pray it again. Pray it again, knowing he's going to fill you, knowing he's going to send you. Wherever you go, wherever your hand touches, wherever your feet go, he's there with you. Come on, pray it again. Oh, give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. God, I want to burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. I want what you desire. about how God keeps getting better and better and every morning and every night we're praising him and we're talking about a fresh, fresh fire. And I really felt like the Holy Spirit said to me today, I want to remind you of who I am. Because what happens is this, when you're reminded of how good God is and who God is, then what happens is like the prophet Jeremiah, a fire is shut up in your bones. You can't contain it. Doesn't matter what you're going through. Doesn't matter what you're journeying through. It's this reminder that God is this ever in, a never-ending revelation of goodness. For eternity, you will find out that God is good. For eternity, you're going to find out that God is even better than you thought he was yesterday. So today, I want us to worship like that today. We're not worshiping a team. We're not just singing a song, but we're worshiping a God is good, who's faithful, who's consistent. Can we lift our hands this morning? So when it's saying, I want that fresh fire, it's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's a reminder of the goodness of God. Lift your hands this morning. Lift your hands this morning. Let's begin to sing this out one more time. Let's begin to make this our prayer. Fresh, fresh fire. What you desire, God, I want to burn for you. Give me a fresh, fresh fire. 
fire Give me a fresh, fresh fire I want what you desire God, I want to burn for you So set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more that's our prayer this morning. Our prayer is not more church. Our prayer is not more religion. Our prayer is more of you, God. More, more, more encounters with the Holy Spirit. More reminders of the goodness and the grace of God. God, we want to, we want to have a deeper knowledge and understanding of who you are. God, we, we, we want to know more about you. Our focus is on you. Our attention is on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. God, it's not about something that I originated, something that I did, but it says Jesus was our pioneer which means he created ground that did not exist. There are things in your life that God's already gone before you and took in the ground for you before you even had to fight that battle. God is so good that he goes into your future and fights the battles for you already and gives you victory and gives you hope and gives you peace. God, you are good. God, you are faithful. God, you are consistent. God, you are steady. God, it's not about me. It's not about me trying to do it, but God, it's all about you, Jesus all about you, Jesus, in your mighty, mighty name. Amen. Come on, can we give God some praise this morning? <laughs> Greet some people around you and welcome them to church as you take your seat. Guys, I have to just say that I'm very thankful for Pastor Cody. I had a nice white button-up that I was wearing in the 9 a.m., and I got a coffee from the cafe downstairs, and as luck would have it, I spilled coffee on my shirt, so that is why I look like I'm going to a funeral today, all black, but it's good, you know, praise God, God is good, and thank God for Pastor Cody and his extra t-shirt in his office. Thank you, Pastor Cody. I didn't come prepared. I should have. I'm a father of two now. I should always bring extra outfits, but, you know, I just haven't learned yet. Um, but we're so thankful for you guys. We're thankful for everything that you guys do. First of all, first and foremost, before we begin, we want to thank you for your generosity. If it wasn't for your giving, if it wasn't for your generosity, we couldn't do this every single week. We are solely based on your giving, and we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for all that you, you, know, you sow into the ministry, and we want to thank you for the future and the things that we want to do are only accomplished through your generosity. The things we want to do with our kids' ministry, our youth ministry, the events that we want to do, the things that we want to throw, the hires that we want to make is all based on giving. So we want to thank you that you're consistent and you're generous as a church, because that's who we are. Free Chapel is not known as a stingy church. We are are a generous church. Amen. And we're thank you for being generous. Thank you for being giving. And if you want to give, you can do so either online on our app, or you can drop it in the box at the end of service. And we'd be thankful for that. And speaking of our kids, how beautiful was that this morning, having them worship? I love having kids worship. You know, some of them are sitting on the stage, but some of them are locked in and they're worshiping. And it just does something in my soul that reminds me of how good God is. And that's why it's childlike faith. They're approaching God with no filters. They're approaching God with just seeing him for who he is, which is their father, their protector, their provider. And that's so good. And so what we're doing this week for our kids is going to be absolutely incredible. It's called Summer Extreme. And at night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, we are going to be doing a camp or for our kids from kindergarten all the way, or no, sorry, three years old. So my son will be there. Praise God. I get a free 
free couple nights. You know, I'm going to do a little date night. Amen. Well, I got another one, but I'll, you know, I'm the pastor at the church. You know, I'm the youth pastor. So my one-year-old might be there as well because I'm getting three, get three free nights. Come on in Jesus' name. No. Um, <laughs> not what it's about, guys. Come on. But we have 400 kids already signed up. Isn't that incredible? 400 kids come in. So make sure you sign up your kids. The best part about it is that it's absolutely 100% free. We just want to serve you. We want to give to you. That's Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Pastor D, who you saw pray, who's powerful. She's a powerhouse. She's leading it back there. So she'll be preaching. Pastor Lance, our kids pastor from Georgia, will be preaching. And myself will be preaching tonight. It's going to be absolutely incredible. So make sure if you haven't signed up your kid yet, make sure you sign them up. And also have them invite a friend because it's free. It's a great time to bring in a new family and kids into our church. And we're excited about that. Also, if you need school supplies, for school. We have backpacks already ready to go. If you need that or you know someone who needs that and they're struggling right now in that in that area, we have st- supplies for you downstairs. So find our team. We want to supply you because once again, we're generous. And because of your giving, we're actually resourcing kids to go back to school where they can have all the materials, everything that they need. So thank you for that. And that's downstairs. And also we have food trucks afterwards. So we'd love to hang and talk to you and get connected. So, but we're excited. Are you guys excited for today? Come on. God is good. We're starting a new series today called Sweeter Than Honey. Turn to your neighbor and say, you sweet. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you real sweet. It's got awkward in here. You're welcome. Sweeter Than Honey. I'm excited about this. Pastor Cody and I have, have sat down with Pastor Jensen, and this has been a collaborated series that we've really worked hard on, and we're excited about it. It's something that we know God's hands on. So the title of my talk today is Honey from the Rock. Honey from the Rock. Psalms 81, 16 says this, But he would feed you with the finest wheat, and with honey from the rock I will satisfy you. But he would feed you with the finest wheat, and with honey from a rock from the rock, I would satisfy you. Psalms 81 is a song of remembrance and a reminder of a time in the, in the wilderness where the children of Israel, as they were, you know, they had gotten out of Egypt and they were walking in the wilderness and they were going from the wilderness to the promised land and they had a complaining problem. They would complain about everything. They would grumble about everything. And Psalms 81 is specifically about this time where in the wilderness, it's a place called Meribah, which means a place of quarreling or contention or fighting. And uh, Moses, they, they were crying out to Moses, said, how did you take us out of Egypt? We were, we were taken care of there. Even though we were in bondage, we were taken care of. And they said, we need water. We're thirsty. We're dying in the desert. And God tells Moses, strike the rock with your staff, and I'll give them water. So what happens is Moses takes the staff, he strikes the rock, and water flows forth. And they're happy campers just for a day. So this is what Psalms 81 is about. It's a reminder of the provision and the protection of God in the places of quarreling, in the places of contention, in the places of hurt, in the places of the wilderness, in the dry seasons, in the times that we're disconnected, in the times that we're feeling off, in the times that we're feeling angry, in the times that we're feeling not taken care of. It's actually speaking of how God is providing and protecting and bringing provision in all of these seasons. It's a reminder that in the wilderness, in the time between deliverance and promise, the time in between when God has set you free and that you get to heaven, the time where there's a wilderness season, this space in between where there is pain, there is turmoil, there is hurt, there's quarreling, there is contention, there is things called life. It's in this space. And it says, from the rock flows forth honey. Generally speaking, we don't think that even... Obviously, a rock we don't think would produce water, but even more so, from the rock flows forth honey. 56 times the word honey is used in Scripture, 56 times. And it's always referenced as something that is good, that is sweet. In fact, it's even used as something that will heal your stomach, that will heal your life. And in Ecclesiastes, it goes as far to say that honey is a necessity in life. Honey is mentioned throughout scripture. It's a delicacy. It's something that it was brought satisfaction and sweetness to your life. It's sweet. It's good. We think of it as just something maybe we add to our tea or to our coffee, but honey to them was a necessity. It was an essential. It was a part of their daily life, and it was something that was so good and so sweet and even healed them. And a rock, it says honey flows forth from a rock. What does a rock represent? A rock is, is, is something that's sometimes hard and difficult and can hurt you and can inflict pain and it can inflict struggle. It can, you know, it it can cut you. It can hurt you. It can, it can bring pain into your life. So what we're saying today is this, that God can produce the sweetest moments 
from the hardest of times. From the hardest times of contention, of quarreling, of discontent, of frustration, of pain, of isolation, of persecution, God can produce the sweetest moments from the hardest of times. We believe that God has a promise of provision and of protection and of purpose, but one promise that you don't see in the Bible, are you ready? One promise you don't see is that there will be no pain. That's not in the Bible. There's no promise where God says that if you do this, you will not walk through pain. You will not walk through persecution. In fact, throughout the New Testament, if you look in every single book, it mentions something called suffering in every book in the New Testament. Pain happens. Contention happens. Isolation, hurt, dryness, these seasons of maybe persecution. This is the the rock in our life. There are times that we walk through seasons of life that we don't know what to do and where to go, but I am here to tell you today that in the hardest seasons of your life, God often produces the sweetest moments. He produces the sweetest revelations. He He produces the sweetest gifts. He produces the sweetest things from the hardest moments, the most difficult moments. But how do we walk through these difficult times and find the sweetest moments? See, it's not a matter of fact, it's not a matter that God won't produce sweetest moments. He's always producing something sweet in the middle of chaos, in the middle of pain, in the middle of quarrel, in the middle of contention. In fact, it says in Romans that God works all things together for the good for those who trust in him. So God is always looking to produce something sweet in your life, even in the middle of your pain. But I want to look today at three things that will help us Find the honey in the place of the rock, in the place of pain, in the place of turmoil, in the place of struggle, in the place of contention, in the place of persecution, in the place of isolation, in the place of quarrel. I want us to today walk away understanding that we can find honey. Over the next three weeks, Pastor Cody and I are going to dive deeper into this subject. Number one is this, honey that you remember. Judges 14 verse 8 says this, And after some days, he returned, talking about Samson, to take her. And he turned aside to see a carcass of a lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body in the lion, and there was honey. We see it right before in this chapter. Samson had wrestled a lion with his bare hands. It's pretty incredible. He didn't have a weapon. He He killed a lion with his bare hands. The Spirit of God came upon him. But you have to understand that when you're wrestling a lion, you know, more than likely you're going to get scratches. You're going to get clawed. Maybe he, got, he maybe got a little nibble on his shoulder. He was like, you know, but he took it with his bare. If, if this was me, if I killed it, what he did is he left it. If I killed a lion with my bare hands, I'm taking it back to the neighborhood telling everybody, <laughs> I killed a lion with my bare hands. Don't mess with me. I'll do this to you. All right? <laughs> right? He leaves this line. He has this battle. But what is this? There was a a contention there. There was tension. There was scratching. There was clawing. There was pain. But he comes back to the place of victory and he finds what? Honey. Honey will do something to you. It's actually remembering what God and the victories that God has already done in your life. When you're in the middle of the places of tiredness and frustration, the first thing you have to do is go back to your past victories that scratched you, that clawed you, that hurt you, and see how faithful God was then. Because Samson could only do this because it said the Spirit of God came upon him. Because of God gave him the victory, so he goes back and he begins to eat and consume the victory that God gave him already. See, sometimes we're so focused on what we want God to do for us now that we forget what God already did for us then. It's in this place that we get revived. It's in this place that we find life. It's in this place that we find faith. It's in this place that we find hope that if God did it then, can't he do it now? It's tasting the sweet honey of the past victories, of the times that God did something in your life, that God moved in your life, that God spoke when you needed him to speak, that God moved on your behalf when you needed him to move on your behalf, that time that you encountered God, the time that you met with God, the time that God did a miracle in your life. It's in these places that we find that even in the difficult Moments of contention, of quarreling, of pain, of hurt, of struggle, of fight, of strife, of suffering. Even in these moments, we can be reminded of the goodness and the greatness of God. Samson had a fight with a lion with his bare hands that he could go back and he can eat the honey. Why? Because God gave him the victory. 
Some of us, we need, to, we need to go back to the storehouse of honey. We need to go back to the things. We need to go into our, our pantry of our life and get the honey and begin to consume it and say, okay, God, what, what are the things that you've already done for me? What are, the, what are the victories you've already brought in my life? What are the things that you've already walked me through? What are the miracles that you've already performed? What are the healings, the restorations, the things that God has already done? Honey makes you remember how good God is. Honey makes you remember the faithfulness of God. Honey makes you remember the consistency of God. Honey makes you remember that God is the one who brings the victory, not you. Honey should make you remember. But in John 16, we see a different type of thing that honey can do. It says this, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been brought into the world. Honey makes you remember like we see in Judges 16, but honey will also make you forget. You know, my wife has been pregnant twice over and um, I'm not gonna act like I know the pain of childbirth, okay? So some of you are like, but you know, guys, we have a, a fun part to play in the procreation process, right? It's like the one thing we think about all the time and bug our wife about all the time, right? And then she has to carry this baby for nine months right? It grows in her stomach. She gets, see, you know, morning sickness. And then, you know, by the, by the ninth month, have you ever seen someone who's nine months pregnant? You know, they're nine months pregnant, even if you're like 10 miles away, you know, <laughs> it's like, there's a pregnant lady around here, you know, like, this like, it's like they cry, you know, it's like, it, they're done, you know, they're done. My wife, when she was nine months pregnant, she's like, don't touch me. Don't look at me. I'm done. You know, I'm like, <laughs> we first went in to have our first kid. We are, we didn't know anything and we didn't read any books. We're like, oh, we'll be fine. Yeah, we got it. You know, and so we didn't read any books. And they're like, oh, we're going to induce you into labor. I'm like, awesome. So we're going to have our kid in like 30 minutes, you know? They're like, no, like 30 to 72 hours. I'm like, three days? Like, right? The labor process is intense. It's crazy. It's, it's everything changes, you know? But what, ha what is Jesus describing? It's painful. It's hurting. You know, I remember my wife being, I can't do this. I can't do this. And she's the sweetest person. I'm like, I don't, yeah, you can. It's like, it's like, I, I don't know. Like, I can't do it either. It's not like I have like a vote of confidence. No, I've done it before. You can do it. You know, it's like guys are useless in the delivery room. But there's this moment where all the pain is worth it and you forget about it. Why? When you have your child, when, when God births something, when God brings life into it, you get a hold that sweet child, the sweetness of the gift of God, the sweetness of the, of, of, of the birthing of a dream, the birthing of a vision. There's something beautiful that it does that when God brings something in your life, guess what you forget? You forget the pain that you just endured. There are times that you're going through pain and you feel like it's never going to end and that you cannot do it. But then what happens is we encounter the very spirit of God and God brings forth what we were trying to produce in our life. And what happens is we forget about the pain. So honey not only makes you remember about the past victories, but it actually helps you forget about the pain in the present trials. Because when it comes forth and what, you were, what God was bringing out of you comes forth and the dream, the vision, the purpose, the encounter, the revelation, when it comes forth into your life, guess what happens? You begin to say, oh, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. All that pain, all that struggle, all that strife, all that contention, it was worth it because God gave me something that I could not have given myself. It's the understanding that pain will be here Contention will be here, but God can produce life out of even the most deathly of situations. God can bring life into any situation. God can bring honey into any circumstance. God can bring honey to the times of contention, of quarrel, of pain, of isolation. God can bring it out, but there's an understanding that we cannot remove the pain from the process. You cannot remove the pain from the process. It doesn't work. Number two, number one is we have honey that remembers. Number two is what happens in the rocky place. Revelation 1, 9 says this, John, your brother and a partner in the tribulation. All right, we're gonna talk about that. Partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and a patient endurance that in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on, and on the account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Pat, Patmos is known 
If you search it up, you'll know, you'll see it. It's known that it's a rocky place. It's literally known to be an island that is just covered in rocks. It's sharp, it's jagged, it's not comfortable. It's not like a place where you like buy a beach house. This is not a good landscape. It's all just rock, lava rock everywhere. And this was a place that was designed for John to die at. This was his exile. He was sent out. They would send out prisoners. They didn't want a part of society anymore. And they would send them to Patmos, the rocky place, the place of jagged, the place of pain, the places where they could get cut, the place they could get hurt. And they would send them there to die. So John is sitting in the place of his, that is preparing for his death and his pain. He's sitting in the rocky place. He's sitting in a place that's cutting him, that's hurting him. It's not a good landscape. And what happens is absolutely amazing. He gets a vision from God himself about what is going to happen in the end times. And he gets a vision that nobody else has gotten before or since of Christ himself in his place of honor and authority at the right hand of the Father. He begins to see Jesus with his eyes of fire and his beard of, of wool and his feet of brass. He begins to see God in this revelation. And he's having to sit there in the rocky place before he gets this revelation, thinking about the seven churches that he pastored, knowing they're in tribulation. Don't you hate it when you're sitting in, in, in and you're in this place and you're isolated and you're in hurting and you're looking at everyone you care about and you know they're being persecuted and you know they're in pain and you just want to help, but you can't. This is where John is at. He just wants to help the seven churches that he planted, but he can't because he's in exile. He can't because he's in the place of the rocky place. He's in the place of pain. He's in the place of hurt. He's been sent there to die and he's sitting here asking God, I want to help, but I can't. And God says, hey, I'm going to have you help churches for all time. I'm going to tell you how this is going to end. So he got the honey of hope. He's sitting here in the rocky place trying to wrestle with how do I help people that I can't help right now, that I'm far away from? How do I help them? How do I let them know? And God says, let me show you something. I'm going to give you the honey of what's to come, the hope of what's to come, that this is not over. This is not where your life ends. This is not where their life ends. I have something, a, a, a great design for the world that is coming right now. And I want to show you and I want to birth it through you. So not just the seven churches will get it, but for churches of all time until Christ returns himself, we'll read the book of Revelation and see what you saw in the place of the rock, in the place of your pain. In the place of your contention, praying that you could help these other places, God says, let me show you how you can help. I want to read Revelation 21 and show you what God showed John. He says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away, he said to them. It's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give a spring of water uh, of life without payment. The one who conquers will have the heritage, and I will be their God, and they will be my son. That is the honey of hope. Where are we headed? He said, this, these former things, this pain that you're in right now is absolutely temporary. But my love and my plan is eternal. God will pour out things that will wipe away the tears that you're, the, the tears that you have right now in your prayer times, the tears that you have right now in your contention, the tears that you have right now that you're fighting through. Guess what? There's going to be a day that God will wipe those tears away and they will no, there will no longer be pain. There will no longer be shame. There will no longer be uh, decisions in the past. God is saying there is a time, there is a hope that is coming. And if we don't understand hope, we don't understand Jesus. Jesus said this, he is coming to bring something that is far better, first with the Holy Spirit, but also a kingdom of God that is coming that is not of this world. So if we live in just the present pain of just saying, I don't know how to deal with this, and we don't know where we are headed, guess what? We are going to be stuck in the rocky place without any hope. And when he says this, I am present with your tribulation. See, sometimes with the word tribulation, we think of just a, a seven-year period at the end of time where there's just going to be a lot of tribulation and we're going to get beheaded for being Christians. 
And that's a part of it. There will be massive persecution in the end times. But tribulation is not just this far off period. Tribulation, when it's speaking in the New Testament, happens throughout the time of the church. It's it, really what tribulation means is this. It means pressure. It means affliction. It means pain. There's even, it means anxiety. There's going to be pressure. There's going to be pain. There's going to be affliction. Why? Because Christ did not promise to remove these things. He promised to protect you in these things. That even in the midst of your tribulation, guess what? God is saying, I will protect you. But honey, get this, was found. The best honey was found in the cliffs. They would have these bees would build the hives and the cliffs and these rocky cliffs. And what would happen would be, it would get so hot in the summer and there'd be so much pressure that what would happen is the purest form of honey would begin to ooze out of the hive. And people would risk their life to climb up and get it because it was so valuable. Sometimes it's actually in the places of pressure, the places of affliction, in the rocky places where God has tucked away that honey that when the pressure comes and the heat comes and the pain comes that it begins to ooze out the purest form of revelation, the purest form of understanding of who God is. Because we cannot get to the, to the promise without pain. We have been comforted and we've actually been a little bit, I think, coddled would be the better word at times in the Western society that we think that God is here just to enhance my life. You know, he's here to upgrade my bank account, upgrade my car, you know, upgrade my spouse, right? We're like trying to do all the upgrades. God is not here to enhance your life. He's here to give you a brand new life. He's not here to just give you uh, the, the American dream. God is here to give you a brand new life and redesign it, not your way, but his way. And understanding this, that in that there's going to be pain. There's going to be times where the conviction of God is, you know, strikes you and that can be painful but it's God removing things that don't belong in your life. See, understand this. God is not here just to enhance your life and try to make your life better. He is here that even in the most painful, hurtful times on this earth that you have hope because you are now flowing and operating from a whole new design, a whole new life. The way that God would operate, the way that God would see things, God will produce honey in the midst of pain. Point number three is this. The rock and the honey, the rock and the honey. Psalms 81 says this, the rock, says the honey from the rock, and I would satisfy you, the. And what didn't say honey from a rock, a little English lesson, you know. It didn't say, you know, honey from a rock or honey from uh, over, the, it says honey from the rock. It's a person. It's a person. This is the beauty of Christ. Christ is both the rock and he is the honey. Christ has embodied your pain and your suffering and he produces the sweetest moments from it. Christ says, I can embody all of this so you can now, now it does not have to affect. I take on your suffering. I take on your pain. I take on your hurt and I will take this and what I'll spring forth is the life that you need. You don't believe me? That's fine. I'll give you some scripture. You ready? We're not there yet. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says this. And they all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Psalms 81, the place of contention, the place of quarreling, the place of hurt. It's saying that in that moment, it wasn't just a regular rock that gave him water. It was Christ himself. Christ embodies the most painful times in your life. See, this is the thing. Sometimes we think that God is, you know, Jesus was just some hippy dippy that walked around and just loved everyone. No, Christ dealt with something that we often don't like to deal with. He took on head on that people only wanted the sweet things in life. They only wanted the miracles of God. They only wanted the things in which God can do for them. They said, well, give us another miracle. Give us, he'd feed the 5,000, do it again. Then he'd heal the sick, do it again, do it again, do it again. Christ came to do something so much deeper than just enhance your life. I know we weren't ready for this this Sunday, but it's okay. It'll be nicer next week. Christ embodies your pain. 
Christ is the rock that flows from. It says he is the river of life, the well of life. Christ is the rock because he suffered and he died. He became the cornerstone, it says, that he, we build our life on. He became the cornerstone. He became the rock. Why? Because he suffered. He suffered. Christ came, it says, he who knew no sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he came from heaven to earth. He took on our human suit. He took on our pain. He took on our persecution. He took on our temptations. He took on everything and he walked in obedience. It says in Isaiah 7, it says this, because of his obedience, Emmanuel's diet will be of curds and of honey. Because of Christ's obedience, it says, you know, curds is milk. It's saying because of his obedience, we can walk in the milk and the honey. We can walk in the promise. God with us walked with us. You don't think he suffered? crucifixion. He was accused of doing something he did not do. His life was exchanged for a murderer's and they took the murder and let him live and kill Jesus. He was scourged 33 times on his back with a scourge that had glass and that had rock that would break his bones and tear apart his skin. And as he's bleeding out, they put a crown of thorns on his head and, and then they make him carry his cross to the place of the skull, which really is this, a place of the rock. That's all Golgotha is. It's a rock. So they make him go on the rock and they put him in front of people and they mocked him and they spit at him and they yelled at him and he is bleeding on the cross. But not only is he suffering a physical pain, not only is he suffering the pain of his body being broken, but at the same time, he's also suffering a very emotional trauma because he's taking on and he's looking at his creation. He's looking at his chosen people and they are mocking him. The people he chose and they're mocking him. They're spitting at him. They're yelling at him. They're, they're gambling for his clothes. But it's not just physical and it wasn't just emotional, but it was a spiritual oppression as well. Yeah. It says that he took on the sin of the world, which means he felt the worst guilt you have ever felt. He felt it for past, present, and future. Everyone's sin. Every time, anytime you've ever felt guilty, guess what? Christ felt that in one moment for every person on earth, even those who would not even accept him. Christ died even for those who won't accept him in the end. He didn't just die for those who accept him. He died for everyone. Whether or not we accept it is now up to us, but he didn't die just for those who... You don't think Christ suffered? And it says if we want to partake in the life of Christ, we must suffer as Christ suffered. It's a part of the deal that when we choose to accept Christ's life, guess what we also choose? To accept Christ's suffering which means dying to self. Dying to self can be easily defined as this, that it's not, you don't get what you want. <laughs> and you're not surprised by it, and you're not angry by it, and it does not control you. Amen. There are times in life, and in fact, it's promised and guaranteed that we will walk through pain. We will walk through suffering, but aren't you glad that we have a God who said, I'm not only just going to embody the honey and the sweet things in your life, but I'm also going to embody your pain. I'm going to be the rock that you lean on. I'm going to be the cornerstone. And you may be going through pain. You may be going through persecution. You may be going through affliction. You may be going through times of quarreling, times of contention. But what I will do is produce what you need, which is life. Christ was not just here to give us an enhanced life, but in the design of this new life that we receive, we receive the suffering that he chose. Christ didn't have to do that. It says in the garden, he actually wrestled with it. So much so he began to sweat blood because he knew the pain that was set before him. But he also knew that the honey that would be produced so he dies on this cross. People are mourning. They're crying. And even that verse we talked about when it's talking about the pregnant lady, it's at that moment. That was the birth pains. That was the painful moment for everyone. He was supposed to be the guy. He dies. He's buried. On the third day, he raises from the dead. And what he's saying here is this, that even 
the hardest thing in life, which is death, I can produce honey. Because what I'm producing is eternal life. Life that goes beyond time and space, life that goes beyond this earth, life that goes beyond your pain, your plight, your hurt, your pain, your persecution, your suffering. And yes, these things will happen. And honestly, we have to understand that. Why did we preach this series? Because I think we need to understand that life can be difficult. Life can be hard. Life can beat you up and tear you down and try to get you to where you give up. But remember this today, Christ is both the rock and the honey. So even when you feel like life is beating you up, tearing you down, you can rely on a God who's been there before. You can rely on a God's pain that he's felt before. It's not just a physical pain. Maybe it is an emotional pain. Maybe your emotions have been damaged and hurt. Guess what? God can relate to that. Maybe it's a spiritual weight. Maybe it's a guilt. Maybe it is a conviction. Maybe there's something on you that's weighing and God's saying, I can, I can lift that burden. I can lift that burden. And from it, I will produce life in you. Don't run from pain. Don't run from affliction. Don't run from contention. We have a generation today who doesn't like conflict whatsoever. We would rather talk about people than talk to people but you cannot come to a resolution if you do not have pain. Sometimes conflict is painful. Sometimes those conversations that are needed with family, and I'm gonna talk more about this next week, it's needed to bring healing. But we have to understand this, that in this life, as the cost of everything in this world is going up right now, inflation is crazy. Guess what else is going up? The cost of following Jesus. It's only going to cost you more. It's only, it's only going to cost you more. There's not going to, the cost is not getting less. It's getting more. There's going to be a, there's going to have to be a moment where you say, no, I'm standing with Jesus. So as everything gets worse, let's stop complaining about it. Let's stop tweeting about it. Let's stop Instagramming about it and going on Reddit and all the blogs and trying to figure out what's next. And let's make a stand and say, our God has the honey that our world needs. He has the hope that they are waiting for. He has it. He has embodied it. So let's make a stand, not out of fear, but on faith, that our God is faithful and he is good and he is consistent and he can produce life out of the most deathly of situations. He can produce hope out of the most pain. He can heal. He can restore. He can make new. Our God is good. Our God is faithful. And what our world needs is believers who don't run from pain, but learn how to live in faith in the midst of pain. Thank you for joining us today. We would love for you to be a part of our free chapel family. Here's what you need to know. Following this service, our teams with the white lanyards will be outside on the patio, ready to meet you and get you connected. We have connect groups that are meeting seasonally all throughout the Orange County and surrounding areas. There's a group in a variety of categories and there is a group for everyone. Also, we will have our team in place that can get you all the information you need to know about things happening in our church. How to get involved with our teams by taking your next steps and so much more. We believe in doing life together and we cannot wait to meet you. As a reminder, if you call this your church home, we want to partner with you and give you the opportunity to give. You can do that by texting GIVE to 510-510. We want to thank you for your continued generosity and being a part of the Free Chapel family.